Welcome to the Imaginative Storm Podcast. I'm your host, James Nave. This show was first aired on WPVM FM, Asheville, North Carolina, WPVMFM.org, if you'd like to know more about community radio. Today, my guest is Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. I knew Juan Isidro years ago when he was in high school and we worked together in the classroom and in other workshop settings around performance poetry. And he still lives in Taos. He works for the Taos News as a journalist. And he's also working with his poetry as he was when I knew him all those years ago. So I like to interview people who are local to Taos when I get that opportunity to do such a thing. And so today that opportunity came around and Juan Isidro had some time and he agreed to be on the show. So what follows is my conversation with Juan Isidro. We're good friends, so it's uh, quite familiar in terms of two people talking. And he reflects on his work as a poet and his work for the Taos News, which is a family-owned weekly newspaper, very popular in Taos. Every Thursday, the Taos News comes out and everybody in town gets their hands on a copy. And before we get to Juan Isidro's conversation, I'd just like to remind you that Allegra Houston and I host an Imaginative Storm Writing Prompt of the Week gathering every Saturday at noon Eastern Time, and it lasts an hour. You can find the Zoom link at imaginativestorm.com. We would love to have you. You can also go to imaginativestorm.com and download some free writing tips. And the the Zoom conversation is really great. It's a conversation. It's a workshop. It's a gathering. So imaginativestorm.com for that link. And now let's turn our attention to my conversation with Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. Uh, Nave, it's good to see you again. I'm glad we got this moment. Well, it's been a long time. I remember the last time you and I did anything together, it was a long time ago when we went down to Albuquerque to the National Poetry Slam Championships, and I was helping the Taos team, the smallest team ever to show up at a National Poetry Slam Championships. I was helping the Taos team work it out down in Albuquerque. So you went, and I don't remember the other two people who were on the team, but it was quite a, quite a trip. I don't know. Do you remember that? A particular round, it was me, Krista Sperry, and Daniel Ingroff. Might have been Sherman Cortez along with that, God rest his soul. So you're naming all those people who were in the early part of the Taos poetry experience in Taos. Taos has always been known for its poetry engagement. It's been doing it for years and years and years. So you are now working at the Taos News. You live on the Taos Pueblo. You are a member of the tribe. And I wanted to start this interview. I was thinking about, well, what will I start out with? And I wanted to ask you to tell us why being a member of the Taos Pueblo community is so important to you, how that membership influences the way you interact with the community and the way you do your reporting here for the Taos News, which is a locally owned newspaper. Not many of those left. No, no, not you're right. Not many of them small papers left like that. In terms of my writing, how it uh, coincides with me being a tribal member, uh, I should point out right away that I don't necessarily like leading with uh, the fact that I'm Native American as a writer. I would very much like to not be looked at as a good Native writer so much as I want to be seen as a good writer. And I think my talents speak for themselves. I can definitely write outside of the Native American indigenous narrative if I wanted to. I just find that subject matter to be a little bit more interesting to me. Um, It's uh, the reason behind my wanting to be a journalist. Early on in, in, in in my life, when you were a big influence as well, because Anne McNaughton and the late Peter Rabbit took me under their wing. Uh, as a high school student, uh, I was in the seventh grade. That's when I started writing. It was a bunch of not stuff a seventh grader would write. 
uh, you know, prepubescent and and through puberty <laughs> kind of stuff, uh, the stuff you'd imagine, right? And then in the ninth grade, when Ann McNaughton suddenly appeared as my uh, substitute Native American studies teacher, she gave a lecture which involved uh, some recordings of Sherman Alexi reading some of his basketball diaries, uh, poetry, and uh, I was a big mouth kid and I drew attention to myself and she called me out on my stuff. Kind of where our relationship started right there. She was like, hey, would you like to learn how to do that properly? It was the 90s. I wanted to be a rap star. I was like rebellious about it. Like, what do you mean? Do it properly. I am doing it right. And she kind of showed me that I didn't have to rhyme all the time. And it worked out really good. And then it brought me into the literary world and the world of poetry. Fast forward to now, I write for the newspaper specifically because of the word accountability. It's a huge word in the Native American community, in any Native American community across the board, accountability. People will either cringe or their ears perk up. I write unbiased. I, I just want the facts. I just want to, you know, put the information out there. And at that, I'm not trying to do any of that really hardcore investigative journalism, you know, exposing corruption. I'm no Aaron Brockovich. Definitely not. I would much rather, as I was saying, change the native narrative. I know that's a really big buzzword right now. Those are huge buzzwords in the native community, in the native world changed the Native American narrative. And it's like, I don't really know what they mean by that. I don't even know what I mean by saying that. All I know is that I want to show my people in a in a better light. Now you get to actually see the lighter side of Taos Pueblo, the, the, the better side of Taos Pueblo, the real side of Taos Pueblo, all that alcoholic stuff, all that death and woe and misfortune and, and all that stuff. That's not really what Taos Pueblo is. You know, that's what outside influences have created inside Taos Pueblo. When you think about alcohol, it's important to point out that this country is awash with alcohol from top to bottom. Alcoholism has been a problem and continues to be a problem for people in every community, no matter where they live in this country, beyond the borders of America, Go to any of the European countries and you find alcohol all over the place. So alcoholism and problems with alcohol, driving under the influence, happens every day in every community all over the place. And so I think that's worth pointing out. So people who do have alcohol problems, it has more to do with just whoever they happen to be as the individual and the circumstances that have ended up surrounding them within the context of alcohol within their own community. If any place I've ever been, all the places I've been, you have both sides. The Taos Pueblo has the person who's driving under the influence. You also have people who are writing terrific poetry. They're raising their families. They're doing everything anybody else would do anywhere else in the world. So I'm glad that you are at the Taos News doing a focus on what life is just like in your community and tying that a balance into the other communities that surround um, surround you and, and then rippling on out from there. I love the notion of accountability because it brings up the term accounting, which quickly moves to math. One and one is two. When you are accountable, you try to or work your life so that you have things add up so that when the equation ends up with its solution, that solution helps other people. I hope my solution is helping other people. And I've come to terms with my own alcoholism. I won't say it wasn't a struggle because it definitely was. At the very end of it all, it came down to a conscious decision. That conscious decision has yielded all these benefits. Coming back to the newspaper, coming back to writing. My wife got me in school, uh, so I was able to finish up my, my degree there. And now I'm basically living the dream. Got back to my writing, which has always been my compass in life, you know, uh, and for a long time I was without my compass. I wasn't writing. It's, it's only been a couple of years that I've been writing for the newspaper. I think a lot of people 
within my tribe are still reluctant to speak to the media because of past experiences and or preconceived notions of what could happen when one speaks to the media. But the thing that I want to express to those folks is that I am one of your own. I know very well what can and cannot be spoken about here at Taos Pueblo in terms of privacy of our, our religion and our culture and things like that. However, I will say this, when I was in high school, from the very people that are in control of our collective lives here at the Pueblo, and I don't, mind you, I'm not necessarily talking about tribal government here, I'm talking about department heads and managerial positions, people in those roles. These are the people when I was growing up that were always saying House Pueblo needed a voice. We need an outlet. Where's somebody to ask these questions for us and put it out there publicly? You have one now. Please trust me. This has always been what I wanted to do with my writing from the very beginning, even as a poet, was to tell my people stories and tell them in a good way tell them truthfully and honestly. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do with the newspaper stuff. What are some of the stories that you've told in a good way? Emilia Lujan, beautiful young sister here from Taos Pueblo, internationally renowned hoop dancer, granddaughter to uh, Bobby J. Lujan. He was my Kiva elder as well. Chris Lujan's daughter, Deer Snow Trail Studios and Farm. The, uh, podcast YouTube that I did with the newspaper called uh, In the Valle, Prejudice and Reconciliation in Taos. That was huge, phenomenally huge, man. I got to talk to John Nichols, uh, you know, Milagro Beanfield War guy. I got to, to talk to Iris Kelts, one of the original Taos hippies, right? Uh, I got to talk to Larry Torres, who is a just a bottomless pit of information and knowledge on this entire valley, even my own people, you know, uh, it's, it's great to hear him talk. And uh, the list goes on. Ilona Spruce uh, and McNaughton. I mean, I, I spoke to a bunch of people. There was, it was a nine part series on YouTube at the Taos news channel. So check it out. We just talked about prejudice and, and how, it's so different in Taos. In Taos, you don't see those kind of lines drawn too often between colors and creeds. The reason we did it was to kind of show that and hopefully maybe model that for other communities to, to, to do, to follow. Because I really think Taos is kind of that beacon and it always has been. From time immemorial, the Pueblo has always been that hub where people would meet to, 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 to do market and trade and, and, and whatnot and commune together, you know, so. There's an ease here around the different groups of people who exist and work and play in this valley. Where well, that's true. And I think it goes back to ancient times. You know, like I said, this this place was the the crown jewel on the Santa Fe Trail before the Santa Fe Trail even existed. Pueblo has always been that place, like a bazaar almost. It makes perfect sense that there would be this underlying acceptance because it's always been there. Taos has always been an open, welcome place. And I know you've heard this before. It's not the people in Taos that decide who gets to stay in this valley, man. It's it's the the big mountain up there, that prestigious peak. You know, that that protective peak that decides it'll either chew you up and spit you out or it'll embrace you lovingly. And I think everybody in Taos knows that everybody in Taos who's lasted here knows that. Well, people who are listening to this show are listening to this show in Taos because it's on KC, KCEI. They're also listening to it on SoundCloud and some of them are in Europe. And then this show is also uh, aired in Asheville. And in Asheville, you have mountains beautiful Appalachian mountains. They call them the Southern Highlands, wow. graceful, easy green mountains. Here we have the Southern Rockies and the mountain that you referred to. So for those people listening outside of this area, would you go a little deeper into your reference to the sacred mountain, the Taos mountain that we all look at every day living here in the valley? It's a great representation of what is the sacred. 
My people have been here since time immemorial. If you want to get scientific about it, Pueblo was once carbon dated back in the 90s. And I believe the results came back to be over 1,200 years old. So there's that. And I would have to say that's, that's just science being science. And it's probably a lot older than that. That's why we say time immemorial, right? I think that's a really mystic way of putting it. So the mountain, it's a great representation of what is the sacred. The mountain has its purpose and its place among the reverend. But it's actually what's nestled behind the mountain that is the holiest of holies, which is our, our lake, Blue Lake. I'm dancing around the sanctimonious, so I'm not really going to go too deep into what it means or anything like that. So that's probably really what I have to say is that it's a great representation of what is sacred. It's a double peaked mountain. Our ancient village is nestled right below it. And there are numerous trails uh, that are only accessible for tribal members that we utilize still today that have always been utilized by my people since time immemorial. That permanence is really what draws people here. And it's something that I've been kind of thinking about lately, you know, the, the permanence and, and, and everything, because I myself am feeling very grounded these days here. Uh, growing up, it was always a, a clamor. To, to get up and out of this place. It's too small. There's nothing to do here, blah, blah, blah. It's so boring. And then I've been through the hustle and bustle of big city life. I've lived in other country atmospheres. There's no place like home. The permanence of this place has a lot to do with people wanting to be here. I just did an interview with Jenna Bass, who was a displaced tribal member. She grew up in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, so kind of upper crusty a little bit, you know, and living with her father, who is a, a renowned sculptor, Alan Bass, and grew up in that art world, right? Uh, but never really got to live here. You know, always was back and forth experiencing it just at a glance and then back home and then her first ceremonies and then back home. She's home now. It's just one of those things, man. You can tell the mountain has already accepted her and embraced her. You know, she belongs here. Well, one of the things about the Sacred Mountain, from my point of view, I came here in 1995, and I've mostly split my time between Taos and Asheville over the years. And when I first came, I heard the story of the Sacred Mountain. It sees you. It decides what it will do with you. It either embraces you or it rejects you. And, of course, people refer to it to it as a mountain. Also, seems like it's alive. One of the things I've noticed about that idea of the mountain seeing you, everybody seems to say, okay, I get it. I understand. Very seldom have I ever heard anybody reject that idea. And it's unusual when you have many, many different groups of people showing up in an area like this with one strong idea, like the mountain sees you, the mountain makes its decision, the mountain embraces you, or the mountain rejects you. You throw that out in other parts of the country, and you'll get a fair amount of pushback. Well, I don't know. You know, how I can't believe that. I, what, what, what does a mountain have to do with me? Here, you know, you don't get much pushback on that. Okay, fine. I will await my verdict. And then it happens, and some people stay and some people go. So I love that idea. And also, you mentioned the, the sacred part of it for your community, your tribe. And I'm thinking about all the communities I've been in. They all have rituals. They have sacred places, maybe not as well established. I mean, you're referring to 1,200 years and even further back, likely. So when you have a group of people connecting that deeply for that long to a piece of land with that much reverence, it makes sense that the stories that rise from that long-term centuries upon centuries of reverence would ring true to anybody who listens. I think so. And like I said, you know, I think it's the permanence, you know, that, that permanence is really what kind of draws people, you know, but say what you will about the, the tourist aspect of things. And, you know, I know there's a lot of talk right now in the community about gentrification and 
people coming in and that's not the way our Taos is supposed to be. And quite to the contrary, that is the way Taos is supposed to be. It's changing, it's ever evolving, and it's ever embracing new and different ideas. And if you really think about it, the scientific side of things with the collapse of the Anasazi culture and the rise of the Puebloan culture, you see that adaptation is a huge thing. Let me just read you something real quick, put it into perspective. This is from the Second Chance Thankful show that's coming up this uh, September 24th, 6 p.m. at Somos, uh, Aki and Taos. It's called My Home. The smell of wet minty sage after a late spring soak of mountain rain. Pinions bursting with nourishment, life embodied, the seed, my home, grows. Under the careful watch of a protective peak, dry creek roads and sunset chants, serenade evening magpies to the saltillo clippity clop of Appaloosa shoes. Vibing on cool adobe, gourds rattle, my home, dances. Red cedar burning a familiar love, dreams in solemn smoke rising into blue lake moonlight, shimmering, sparking a familiar feel as the drum beats, boom, 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 boom. My home bleeds. Through ancient aquifers feeding the red willow, two muddy palaces, resilient and proud, between a thousand years of tradition and the future, my home stands. Proudly, a humble people practice principles, impressions left in stone, before the sangre of their Cristo dried, while the earth was still soft, from a time immemorial. Whispers of the old speak Tiwa, and my home prays. Prayers that echo further than forever, clandestine ceremonies, caravan and invocation for every soul, for every spirit. Suns rise and set, moons wane and wax, curtains call the ends of acts, chapters close, but my home, our home, lives. Taos will always be here, no matter where we go. And the reason Taos will always be here is because it's not necessarily a place, because Taos has existed elsewhere before, in time and in space. And it's always right here, man. So. They, when they say home is where the heart is, I know that's a very country Midwestern American saying, but it's true. Home is truly where the heart is. I believe that. And in many ways, a lot of the conversations that we have all over the world, the conversations always seem to bring us back to where we started, where we were born. People try to make peace with it. You said, I've traveled away to the cities and I've returned home. The home is an idea that lives beyond us. Home is an idea where we dwell. And when I think of the comment you made about change and the piece you just read, which of course is beautiful. I've always loved your work. I'm glad to see that you have evolved, that you have changed, that you have formed yourself and are continuing to form yourself. You know, a child went forth every day and the first object that child looked upon, that object that child became. So when we think about our communities, Taos community, the Asheville community, and anywhere else, anybody's listening to this show, I have never known a community that remained the same. It always changes. And we as human beings change constantly. And we're evolving, we're moving through our lives, and then eventually our lives fade and we're no longer there, and then we become part of the memories of what we now call home. Do you have another piece that you could read from what's coming up on yeah. the 24th, which will be tonight, if you're listening to this show on KCEI, Cultural Energy Radio out of Taos, and if you or listen to this show somewhere else. It will be Saturday night, September the the 24th. I think it. I'm going to say 6.30, show up. Maybe you're going to open it at 7. Is that about right? Uh, we- most likely, yeah. It's not going to be too long of a running show. It's a small chat book. Uh, we're talking maybe 20 minutes of poetry and probably an additional 15 or 20 minutes of just chit-chat. <laughs> So I can introduce the pieces and stuff, you know. Um, 
But yeah, uh, it's going to be Jimmy Santiago Baca is reading in the park earlier that day. So I'm definitely going to be there at that. And that ends at four. And then there is a recovery purple candle vigil at the Pueblo there in, in honor of those that are in recovery. I'm going to be at that. And then that ends at 530, uh, 6.30. And right from 6.30, straight over to Somos. And we're going to get the show going as soon as everybody's settled. So it may be a little bit before 7. I would say get there right at 6.30. A little piece called February. Should I be talking with spirits instead of this page? Or do I pray? From one father to another, do I talk this way? No matter what doctors say, just keep the faith. Can I say that up and down these sterile halls, tragedy exists in the chest of little miracles. Life through tubes and respirators. Parents learn to let go. Parents learn to persevere. Pediatric intensive care unit veterans. Can I say that, that we're scared, that we're terrified, that somehow it's all our fault? The helpless parents of the helpless. Can I say they call it transposition of the major arteries, but really it's just messed up plumbing. Surviving through the leaks, the VSD, one defect killing, one healing. That there's a third and fourth narrow vessels in a bad flight. Would'ves, should'ves, and whys keep piling up, and I ain't thought of much else. Can I talk about purpose and say that in the instance I first held a little star, life got simple. That bleach scrub walls provide enough space for high def memories too bright to ever fade. That pain is great. When watching brand new life deteriorate, it hurts so bad. We can't let go. I can't let go. And want to talk about shame. My shame. Me, me, me. Because I know I'll end up making this about me. Can I talk about pride and put selfish wishes aside where dreams of memories not yet had infuriate blasphemy like a shot in the nuts from Jesus? At a crossroads where we'd rather set up camp than see the end, choose a path. We hold tight to teachings we can't give. It ain't fair to never see them splashing, sloshing home in waterlogged Nikes. I just bought them yesterday. Out in the fields, knee high in rubber boots and irrigation dishes. And all this is just an old poem. Can I say that I don't even want to breathe and stand tall while knees crumble beneath me? No fingers to point, not even skyward, because acts of God are to be dismissed as such. Will the sun rise tomorrow? We question, knowing no explanation will ease the guilt, because I know it's my fault. And to convince me otherwise would be to breathe underwater. Fish don't swim and birds don't fly. Tell me I'm lying. Make me talk of dreams that bring me smiles in my sleep, unaware broken hearts can't love, but battle to live with a wish for death, because I'd give my last for his first again and again. Temples are poisoned and babies are born with wings. In my first relationship, we lost our first child, transposition of the major arteries. Uh, that's what it was. It was an act of God, completely undetectable until birth. He lasted about six months, Presbyterian Heart Hospital. The heart surgeon funked out on us and decided not to do the surgery. His associate had an associate a colleague from college whose whole career was based on this particular ailment. They flew us out to Philadelphia on the way to Philadelphia. He, my son went two and a half hours without proper fluids and oxygen. So instead of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia getting a healthy candidate for surgery for heart transplant, instead they got a dying baby. So long story short, he didn't make it. We landed here in Taos, much against the flight nurse's wishes. She was really pissed off that the pilot decided to land in Taos instead of Albuquerque, where the flight originated. War chief staff here from the Pueblo escorted me to the Pueblo. Whew, this is always the part where it gets hard. I went inside the Pueblo, I rang the bell, and <clears throat> I had never seen so many people just randomly inside the Pueblo. It was like they were waiting for me to come home and do it. And uh, it was it was just, yeah. That's when I decided that I would use my talents to do something for my people. But I was really messed up in the heart and in the head at the time. So I ended up becoming an alcoholic instead. <clears throat> my wife pulled me out of that. Uh, without her, I wouldn't be here today. She, I, uh, after my son passed, I was really literally trying to kill myself with alcohol. I, I had no 
inclinations of putting a bullet through my head or, or, or anything like that. But um, if it hadn't been for her, it, it might have led to that eventually because the, the alcohol just wasn't working. I mean, I even drove my vehicle down the wrong way uh, on the freeway in Albuquerque and <laughs> something was there keeping me safe, you know, uh, and, and something has always been there. There's a huge part of this book, this chat book that's coming out with the show second chance thankful it's it's what it's about man i have a second chance at life i have a second chance to do what i originally set out to do you know to serve my people in the way that i that i that i've always wanted to well you know i remember when we first met and you were in the ninth grade i was working here in taos going back and forth as i've said to Asheville. so i worked with you and those other students and i remember you were saying that then this is what I want to do. That's this has always been been your theme. If you don't mind, what was your son's name? Um, Cole Little Star Concha. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm thankful that you have enough wherewithal to be able to tell the story because it certainly has great meaning, I'm sure, to those listening and for me personally. Do you feel your son's spirit? How is it influencing you? What's it doing for you? Hummingbirds have a lot to do with it. There was a point when uh, it was just after he passed away and it was like the middle of January in the middle of a whiteout snowstorm. And I was just standing out on my dad's front porch. I can see where I was standing from where I'm sitting right now. I was standing outside on my dad's porch. I can see where I was standing from where I'm sitting right now. And I'm standing there on my dad's porch, looking out into that just white out nothing. And I hear this faintest little, you know, chirping, little, you know, little, right? And it can't be. No way. And here comes this little hummingbird through the damn snowstorm. And it sits there right in front of me. And it flutters around a little bit and then it spades off like hummingbirds do in the spring and summertime. And it's the dead middle of winter. And my aunt happened to be standing there, my Aunt Dolores, and she comes out of the out of the house. And she put the shoulder, hand on my shoulder and tells me, see, he'll find little ways to tell you he's okay. And ever since then, you know, it's been okay. Uh, I'm not saying that it's been easy. I will have to say that in these kind of situations where a parent outlives a child, you don't necessarily ever heal from it, but you do learn how to persevere, how to go on. A big part of why I'm able to get through the majority of the story like I had now is because of Ted Wired here in Taos, uh, New Mexico. For a long time, I've been dealing with the loss and, and the pain and the suffering and just kept peeling back the scab and the wound was this festering nasty open thing and this is all you know it's very graphic but it's it's an analogy that ted helped me put together and it's because i can't have this gaping open festering wound of, a, of an ordeal of an experience i have to turn that into a scar of wisdom and through the writing now and through going back to school and being in recovery you asked me the other day when I ran into you if I'm recovered, and I said yes, but not that's a half statement. I don't think anybody truly ever is completely recovered. I think recovery is an everyday active thing. Well, when I saw you and asked you that, I was half thinking about substance, your recovery. I was also delighting in the fact that you had this amazing young career as the spoken word artist in Taos and and it was moving along and then you got a little twisted up so I think I was now that I think about it saying I'm glad you have recovered your momentum around the work that you were doing with your writing so one maybe never fully recovers but you can pick back up something you can recover it I recovered my momentum and now I'm carrying it forward so I was referencing that as much as anything else. And I was really yeah. glad, to, I'm really glad to see that because I always thought if he ever catches that wind, that boat's going to sail quite a distance. 
<laughs> Thanks, Navi. I hope so, man. I, I don't want it to sail too far. You know, I, I, I don't want to like, like I, I look at some of the native activists and dude, I am so not that guy, man. I am so not the thick, long braids, you know, ribbon shirts and you know, I'll rock my box on Rock Your Mox Day. I am me. I am definitely me. And I am all for standing up for my people. I like my setup now. I like that I'm writing for the newspaper. I love that I'm writing for the newspaper. I got to give a big shout out to Stacy Matlock and especially Lynn Robinson. That lady, she's the one that opened the door, man, and gave me the opportunity. Her daughter was just running for mayor. I voted for Genevieve Oswald. At the time, I was a county resident, so I could. Uh, <laughs> um, but Gen- Genevieve also owns the laundry, the the, the dry yeah, cleaners. Yeah, owns the laundry, and and, and <laughs> this this is not this is this has nothing to do with playing my vote or anything like that. But her and my mom are good friends. <laughs> I've known Lynn Robinson a long time, and she, like so many of the other artists I've known here in Taos and other places as well, what Lynn's done and what you are doing, and what I admire most about. The, the artists I know who, who stand up for things, you stand up for your art first. Lynn stands up for her art first. And what I mean by that is she shows up today and does something. You show up today and you do something, and then tomorrow comes and you do it again. And that's what makes the contributions that you've made and Lynn's made and the other people I know have made. Even this show is part of that. I do this show so I can get people like you to come and talk to me, especially people whom I've known for, I guess you and I have known each other for at least 17, 18 years, maybe more. I don't even know now. I don't even know if it matters. It's quite a while. So I love to get people on this show to talk about these things because in our explorations through these conversations, we learn things and maybe people listening out there will learn something as well. And it's important. The person standing right in front of you, that's the person who's the most important human on earth in that moment. Word. I agree to that. You asked me about my son's influence, my the one that passed away. I wouldn't say he's a huge influence on my writing. I don't, it's not often. I think that one piece is the one time I've actually ever wrote about him. It's not something I dwelled on in my writing. His influence comes in my family life. Like I said, my wife pulled me away from 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 the pit. And when I met her, she had two sons, Demetrius and Sheldon. They were three and two years old. And I raised them since they were two and three years old. And they're very much a part of the Pueblo. They've been to the Kiva. They've danced. They've ran for uh, May 3rd and such activities. And then we had Kale and Hunter. Kale is a spitting image of me, man. He he took all my hair, man. <laughs> and then there's Hunter, who's like very much like my mom. Uh, he keeps us all grounded, very, very well centered. And that's where the influence from him comes in. You know, I lost that opportunity with him. I'm not going to lose that opportunity with my boys now. So that's where that influence is. When I think about the way influences affect us, when you told the story of coming home and going back to the Pueblo and the folks gathering around, embracing you, accepting you, understanding the grief you were experiencing, you allowed yourself to connect to your emotional interior. You didn't hesitate. I watched it on the Zoom screen. People will hear it on the show. When one goes into those kind of emotional deep rooms, in their psychologies or when you went into your deep room into your psychology it allows me to do the same as the listener it gives us all permission to connect to those emotional interiors and when we do that we open up and we draw energy and that energy emerges out into our writing and when someone reads what we write or when someone reads what you write They reflect on what you are writing. They also pick up on that energy and they open up as well. So even though your son may not always be there, you are able to go into that emotional 
place, that emotional space, even if you're not aware of it, even if you're just writing about somebody hanging a red light down on the main drag, somehow it's still there. For me, every piece is different and every piece carries with it the, its own its own spirit in a sense. Every one of those pieces that I write in there is individual and almost, I would say, to the point where it's maybe a different person reading it, saying it. I, I know that he's around and in that very spiritual kind of way, yes, he is of influence. But when I'm writing, it is very much just me and the pencil or whatever the tool is that I am writing with. And the words, I don't know, man. I hate to say that. It's so cliche to say I am the vessel. You know, I think a lot of writers say that. And in my particular case, I really, truly do feel like that because on one hand, I'm writing not necessarily for me. I'm writing for the people that around me, for my people. And that, that's the stories that I tell in the paper. And when I write poetry, that's just a reflection of the world around me. And I think that's important because the true mirror, the true reflection of society is in its poetry. This is a reflection of the society that I can see. And when we use the term vessel, a vessel is a delivery system. You load your cargo on the ship, the vessel, and you sail across the sea and unload the cargo in a harbor in another land. So it would be fair to say that we are vessels, artists are vessels, and anybody who does anything is really a vessel. You take whatever you create and you deliver it somewhere. So I, I think it can be a cliche. I'm a vessel if you add too much importance to it. Staying right there on the water, if you will, or on the ground, the vessel is the delivery truck. It's the UPS driver who takes the package to the door. It's the, the local garbage truck driver that picks up the trash and carries it away to the dump. It's the <laughs> friend who goes to the grocery store and picks up the groceries for your grandmother and brings them home. You name it. So in some ways, I, we're all vessels delivering something. And that's what you're doing, my friend. I don't know how you feel about that, but I, I think I think all those analogies worked really well, except for the UPS truck driver part, man. Because <laughs> I mean, you know how it, you know how they can. I'm sure you've heard stories here in Taos, man, and probably even out in Asheville. You know, I, I reckon there's some there's some uh, boonie parts out there. You know, oh, they said my address is undeliverable. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, dude, I, I don't know. I'm not. This is certainly not a plug for UPS, but those people that do the <laughs> delivery work. And they drive those trucks around. They are earning their keep. And I imagine sometimes they get confused, no matter whether it's a UPS truck or any, any other delivery truck. I know I've staggered around some places in different states I've traveled in. Back in the day when the GPS wasn't so engaged, I had to look at a, a napkin. Do I turn right? Do I turn left? Where am I? We're getting close to our time to say goodbye. Maybe right. offer up one last piece of poetry for us before we go. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is the crown ship piece in Second Chance Thankful. And the reason it is, is because it is very much me. And you actually may have heard this piece before. This piece goes way back, but it's changed over the years. And it's called Speaker Hum. Sometimes these words speak right through me. Sometimes these words speak right through me and spill out over the page, 40 ounces of myself splashing on the curb. When I say that's my word, even though they don't really belong to me and are only part of the song of me, because these are the breaks. Break them up, break them up, break them up. I'm used to these words flowing, not knowing which way they'll sweep. My lightning lips speak no doubles about the troubles that plague my peoples and keep them higher than church steeples. Addictions of every kind, corrupt minds, cripple community, the blind, leading the blissfully ignorant. I'm sick of it. I want these words to ring with truth. I want these words to ring with truth and reach far beyond the soundproof booth, like sirens coming through for the world to hear, to make the world aware. There's still some natives out there past that big red casino sign trying to live like it's in the 1600s and party like it's 1999. 
So I'll peel these words from my tongue and give them to my son. If no one else will have them, since no one else will have them, that won't have them. Pick them to pieces and draw up their own thesis. These words, sometimes they speak right through me. So sue me, and I'll give half of the nothing I own. The what that can't be regrown from the rubble of our broken home. You see, I'm not alone. We poets are like raindrops, nourishing the world with canvas, cameras, paintbrushes, and ink to film canvas and paper, brick walls and aerosols through spinning vinyl and mic checks one, two, one, two. And these words are weapons of mass resurrection. Spirits of Quetzalcoatl, Pope, and Tupac reside in the sounds my syllables create when I'm up late and it's just me and destiny, just me and fate. These words, they just speak right through me. They just speak right to me. And they say, don't give up. Bravo, sir. Bravo. Well done. Before we say goodbye, tell people how they can get in touch with you. I know as a journalist, you're always interested in stories about the Taos community. And since this is airing at on KCEI, people might want to find you. So how do they do that? Yeah, that's uh, that's great. Um, uh, best way to get a hold of me is through my Facebook page, the pages of Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. I know that's a long title. I'll say it again. The pages of Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. That's on Facebook. Um, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, right now, especially in terms of uh, stuff like this, uh, you can find all my newspaper articles there, links to them. Uh, we'll be getting a link to this show as well. So if you want to check that out later on, you can do so there again. Yeah, that's that's the best way. Message me. <laughs> all right. So the pages of Juan Isidro, the poet on Facebook. Is that right? The pages of Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. Well, Juan Isidro, thanks again for being on the show. All right. Thanks, Nave. And so there you go, my friends, my conversation with Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. So if you would like to find out more about what Juan Isidro is up to, you can go to the pages of Juan Isidro, the poet Concha. The pages of, you can spell that, J-U-A-N-L-S-I-D-R-O-T-H-A, poet Concha, C-O-N-C-H-A, J-U-A-N-L-S-I-D-R-O, T-H-A, poet, P-O-E-T, Concha, C-O-N-C-H-A. So thank you for tuning in to Imaginative Storm podcast, one of many. I do appreciate it. I'm your host, James Nave. Join us any Saturday morning. Allegra Houston and I host an Imaginative Storm writing prompt of the week gathering with writers from all over the world. Our community is growing. We would love for you to be part of it. You can find the Zoom link at imaginativestorm.com. You can also download some free writing tips while you're there. Hey, and there's much more. Check it out, imaginativestorm.com. Thanks again for tuning in. More to come. Till then, I'll catch you on the turnaround somewhere down the line.